Well, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Dr. Jonathan Alvarado, and you have tuned in to another episode of Global Pentecostal Perspectives, emanating right here, live from the uh, from our studio here, the GPP Studios. And I'm so excited to see each and every one of you on tonight. The, tonight's stream is going to be bananas. I'm looking forward to what's going to happen on tonight, the dialogue, the conversation, and of course, my dialogue partner. So I want every one of you weigh in as our custom is. Will you please weigh in and let me know where you're viewing? I see you. I see you. You already in there. You already put in the dialogue tribe. You love the way Dr. Hendricks talked about his grandmother's church-possessed parents. Good for you. Absolutely. It's time to set the record straight. I'm glad to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Roddy Bridges, good to see you, man. I, I want to see you in church. Come see me in church. I missed you in church. The rest of you are way in. Let me know where you're viewing. I want to hear from you. I want to see you. I want to know where, where it is you're viewing. Uh, where you're coming in, the cities, the states, the countries that you're coming in on tonight. Uh, I believe from Poughkeepsie, New York, good to see you, Jennifer. All of you, uh, it's such a valuable and wonderful time tonight. And I want to encourage each and every one of you. Michael Young is now coming in from Lakeland, Florida. Glad to see you. Uh, uh, but you, hey, Roddy, you don't have to, they, we build in, you do have to RSVP, but you, you, uh, we build in an extra amount. So come on to church, bring your family, the whole clan. Bishop White, good to see you. My son, Darian, good to see you, my son. So good to see you up there in the Chicagoland area. Good. 14-year-old on the stream tonight, because this is going to be an incredible stream tonight, if I say so myself. I've been anticipating it. Good. Uh, Octavia, good to see you here from Stockbridge and from Hempstead, New York. Opal, thank you for being on. Pam Johnson from Reading, Pennsylvania. So good to see each and every one of you. Louis Russell in Chicago, good to see you, man. My deacon in, in Chicago, good to see you. Pikesville, Maryland in Baltimore, good to see you. Pensacola's in the house tonight. I am excited about the stream tonight because we have one of the most prolific thinkers, uh, most uh, prolific writers, uh, theologians. He's a uh, Bible scholar and a theologian par excellence. He is a thinker and uh, a lifter of the church. He is a man of God. He is a servant of the Most High, and he is uh, a, a public intellectual, public theologian that adds the weight of his scholarship to the uplift of the church so that we, as a people of God, can indeed grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I believe that one of the things that is so important that we tap into in this season is the truth. And this man is a truth teller. And so some of you all are familiar uh, 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 with um, with uh, our, my guest's work. And so I'm, I was reading a comment. Sorry. Uh, I have a question. Have you had Dr. Miguel de la Torre on one of the broadcasts? I have not. I do not know who that is, but I'd love to get to know them. Okay. All right. Uh, so keep weighing in. Keep letting me know. Uh, do me a favor. Like, share, subscribe, tag, publicize in some way uh, the broadcast. Let them know that Dr. Jonathan Alvarado is on the air. He's got a very special guest tonight and they do not want to miss what's going to happen. I'm going to read uh, a bio of our guest tonight. Good. Blessings to you as well. Now, Zell, good to see you on tonight in Jesus name. I'm going to read tonight a bio. Uh, uh, because I believe it's important that we know them that labor among us and esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. So I want to read his bio. It's effusive and it gives us an insight into uh, this the greatness that we have in the midst of us. My mom used to say to me when I was a boy, if you ever want to be great, you're going to have to learn how to walk in the shadow of greatness. And uh, tonight we have a great gift that's with us in the person of Dr. Obery Hendricks, Jr., Dr. Hendricks is a lifelong social activist, one of the foremost commentators on the intersection of religion and political economy in America. He is the most widely read and perhaps the most influential African-American biblical scholar in writing today. Cornell West calls him one of the last few grand prophetic intellectuals. A widely sought after lecturer and media spokesperson, Dr. Hendricks's appearances include CNN and MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, Fox Business News, the Discovery Channel, PBS, BBC, NHK, Japan Television, and the Bloomberg Network. He has provided running event commentary for National Public Radio and MSNBC and the Al Jazeera and Aspire International Television Networks. 
Dr. Hendricks has been a member of the Faith Advisory Council of the Democratic Na National Committee, for whom he delivered the closing benediction at the 2008 Democratic Convention, served on the National Religious Leaders Advisory Committee of the 2008 Democratic Presidential Campaign, and served in the Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group at the U.S. Department of State under Secretaries of State Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. He is a distinguished senior fellow at the Democracy Collaborative in Washington, D.C., and has been an affiliated scholar at the Center for American Progress, was a senior fellow at the Opportunity Agency Social Justice Communications Think Tank, is on the advisory board of the Institute of Christian Socialism, and is a member of the board of directors of the Public Religion Research Institute. Dr. Hendricks has been a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post and to Salon.com, a former editorial advisor to the award-winning Tikkun magazine and contributing editor to the Encyclopedia of Politics and Religion. The Dictionary of Biblical Interpretation has called his work, and I quote, the boldest post-colonial writing ever seen in Western biblical studies. Dr. Hendricks' best-selling book, The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted, published in 20, uh, 2006, was declared essential reading for Americans by the Washington Post. Social commentator Michael Eric Dyson proclaimed it an instant classic that immediately thrust Hendricks into the front ranks of American religious thinkers. The Politics of Jesus was featured uh, was, the, uh, was the featured subject of the 90-minute C-SPAN uh, special hosted by the Center for American Progress, Class, Politics, and Christianity. The 10th anniversary of its publication was acknowledged at a major 2016 panel at the American Academy of Religion and its annual convention, I'm sorry, at its annual convention in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Governor Howard Dean, former chair of the DNC, has called this book, the, uh, called his book, The Universe Bends Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church and Body Politic, uh, a tour de force. His current book, the one we'll discuss tonight, Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith, has been published by Beacon Press this year, 2021. A former Wall Street inve investment executive and past president of Payne Theological Seminary, the oldest African-American theological seminary in the United States, he is currently a visiting scholar at Columbia University, a visiting professor at Un Union Theological Seminary, and at Yale Divinity School. An intellect par excellence a great thinker, a, a prolific writer, and our guest tonight on Global Pentecostal Perspectives. Well, friends, I did. I tell the truth and lie not. Here he is tonight in the flesh, in person, our friend and interlocutor tonight, Dr. Obery Hendricks Jr. So glad to have you on the stream with us tonight. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be with you, uh, Bishop Alvarado. Thank you for the uh, the invitation and thank you for your very kind words. Uh, you know, I must sound pretty good on paper. I don't know, man. I tell you, <laughs> so, but thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> your paper persona is exceeded only by your by your public and and physical presence here on the stream, and we are so excited to have you on, friends. Thank you. Uh, again, tell a neighbor, tell a friend, let somebody know that Dr. Hendricks is on the stream with us on tonight. Mm -hmm. In the reading of your bio. I shared uh, uh, several of the uh, publications that you have, the kind of trajectory of your thinking along the, along this wise. And I want to make sure that all of uh, our stream audience knows that all of these, I put links to all of these books in the description. So whether you're watching on my Facebook page or whether you're watching on my YouTube channel, there's links to the description. If you're watching on the GPP uh, Facebook page, or my YouTube channel, my personal YouTube channel, if you're watching the GPP YouTube channel, 
and my Facebook page. You have links to all of these in there. I think they may be in the others, but if not, just come over and click those links. You can purchase on Amazon, The Politics of Jesus. It is yet available. It is wonderfully relevant. It is incredibly insightful, and it's a smackdown for some of the thinking about Jesus and the work that Jesus, uh, the, the, the ministry of Jesus that has been oftentimes given unto us. Uh, I have a particular, uh, well, I have a particular affinity uh, for, for this, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but your work, uh, The Universe Bends Towards Justice, opening up with a commentary on on the gospel, on gospel music and the Holy Dope Dealer, all of that was just, it was so in line with some of my own work by way of African-American Pentecostal worship. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it was so informing of my work and so helpful to kind of lift up my thinking about uh, gospel music in particular, which I've been uh, a participant in literally all of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's just, I've just been very, very fortunate and favored and blessed to be able to have read and and, uh, and been involved and engaged in your work along that wise. So these two, again, are are linked in. And then tonight, if you have not purchased the book that we're going to discuss tonight, which is Christians Against Christianity, the link is in the description. Make sure that you click the link, get this up. Uh, uh, book. Uh, this is the book we're talking about tonight. Get this one. Get it and read it from cover to cover. You can do it in one or two settings, and it will uh, encourage you and lift you and instruct you and stretch your thinking. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's chock full of scholarship, but it is accessible. And so I want to encourage each of you to do that. I even put one or two other books in there. I think I put um, Anthea Butler's White Evangelical Racism. I linked that as well because these are companion texts that mm-hmm. those of you all that are serious about this kind of thinking and about the liberative practice of African-American spirituality, uh, I think that um, these books will be beneficial in your life. All right? Good. Uh, This is the most important comment on tonight, Dr. Hendricks. This is my bride, Dr. Tony Alvarado, (laughs) uh, my wife of almost 30 years. And uh, when she's excited about a show, then it is time, time, time. uh, (laughs) In Jesus' name. All right? Good. So glad. There's so many of you, so many of the persons that have shared and uh, in have shared with us on the stream, but have been uh, recipients and participants in hearing your work and are excited about this, uh, excited about you being here, all of these persons tonight. Yes, indeed. Thank you for bringing Professor Hendricks into our thought life. And you, uh, Colette has been a wonderful supporter of the stream, but also is very familiar with your work as a theologian and scholar in her own right. So I'm going to just stop talking and let you make any opening comments before I start just asking questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. George Miller down in Augusta, Georgia, saying it's going to be awesome. It, I believe it. I'm I'm like a kid in a candy store. But our rules are this. They typically will talk for the first uh, uh, 45 minutes to an hour, and then uh, we'll open it up and let them ask questions at the end. Uh, okay. Dante, I'm hoping that I can get you on to talk about your new book. I'm sure hoping you'll uh, have some time in the very near future, uh, perhaps mm-hmm at the end of this year or the first part of next year to come and hang out with me on GPP for a little while. I'd love to have you all. Okay, uh, good, good. Anyway, if you'll go go ahead, just make whatever opening comments you want to make. Well, now, I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you, uh, uh, <clears throat> Bishop Alvarado. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> because this is, uh, this is the kind of, of work we need more of, this kind of podcast, uh, with this level of intellectual engagement that you bring to it, the seriousness of it. Um, the open-mindedness of it, and uh, you know the very clear intentionality to make a difference. Mm. And that's that's you know not to entertain or to you know or or to show your intellectual uh, uh, gymnastics, but to really make a, a difference and and uh, raise the consciousness uh, among the people at church. So I'm I'm really glad to be here, and I I take my hat off to you, brother. I really do. Well, thank you for saying so, and I appreciate you have demonstrated your uh, your your uh, sincerity in those statements in being here. Because a man where your stature and caliber, I am so grateful for your presence. Let me ask you: mm-hmm. in reading this and your other two, uh, your first two books uh, in this kind of trilogy in succession, um, you're auto, you you do a good bit of autobiographical theologizing. Mm-hmm. I am of the opinion that all theology is in some way autobiographical. Yeah, self-revealing uh, at the least, right? Ab- absolutely. Mm-hmm. But when I read your story, it, you, you opened up the politics of Jesus with your story, a part of your story, and mm-hmm. you Im- Im- imbued uh, a part of your story in the universe bends towards justice. 
And then you start off in your story, your upbringing in Virginia and the effects of white evangelical racism in the 1950s in Virginia and how it directly impacted you and class. So all this autobiographical nature. Um, what What is the backdrop to, the impetus for, and perhaps your encouragement to others to, to, to think theologically through their own narrative, through their own story, through their own life? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, we uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and I'm going to ask you if you would just summarize that just a, a bit more so I can make sure I'm speaking to it directly. It, 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 in each of the three books, and particularly in Christians Against Christianity, mm -hmm. this book had so much impact to me because you started it off in an autobiographical way. Yeah. You talked about how racism mm -hmm. directly impacted you in the town you the town that you were raised in, the five year rather than integrate the schools, mm -hmm. spent five years shutting down the public schools. Mm -hmm. where, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that particular thing, and how that that, that 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 influenced your writing of this text, mm -hmm. and perhaps should influence because the, the, I guess the thing that I'm driving at is oftentimes we see racism as some abstraction. Yeah. So distant. Yeah. But you started all three of your books with an autobiographical understanding of mm -hmm. how these things have directly have intersection into your one life. And it's challenged me to think about how these things have had intersection with my own. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that our stream audience will begin to think more clearly on how these things have intersected with their lives and perhaps how that became the impetus for your writings. Well, you know, it's 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 a good question because I think it's important. Um, you know, even though I'm, I'm trained as an academic a scholar, um, when we deal with things that uh, impact our life chances directly, I think it's important to to drop the uh, the academic pretense and come from the heart. You know, mm. in other words, don't don't uh, approach it theoretically. Um, you know, because too, uh, too many of my my colleagues are. It seems like they. They're trying to impress folk with how much theory, uh, social theory that they sure. they know, and, and that really has its place. But but um, I'm of the mind that we have to talk about who we are, where we come from, for a couple of reasons. One of those, of course, is uh, to hold up the magnificence of uh, the culture that we come out of. Mm. So I I I um I offered my experience. With racism and also with my experience with my um, with my extended family, um, as a counterpoint or as an example, what Christianity, biblical Christianity, uh, you know, should should be. Also to show the country that Afro Christianity is more humane. Than, than mainstream Christianity. Well, then you didn't you didn't drove, drove right to the right to the end. That is, and and that's exactly um, the way that uh, and, and and that is what and that is what we have to portray for our own people uh, to lift our own people up, but also to you know to show that there's we have something that we really that we really don't need to be listening to those who are. Um, in essence, lying on the gospel. Um, one thing I did want to mention, though, my first book, which is not my autobiography, my biography is a book called Living Water, which is uh, uh, a biblical novel, historical novel. It's an African-American retelling of the story of the woman at the well. Mm. Um, and in that book, by the way, a lot of women's groups, uh, I, I love, it, love it. It came out 20 years ago, but they still use it in... Um, in, uh, in, in, in women's uh, Bible studies. Um, but in that book, I, I told the tale of surrounding and leading up to the woman at the well through the prism of African-American uh, culture to show the magnificence of who we are. Now, in the South, people in the South, and particularly in the country, know about this. You call everybody, at least my parents, uh, generation, they call each other Mr. and Miss. Everybody, you know, um, children called Mr. and Miss. Adult called each other that. Th the kind of respect that we had, uh, that we have for each other, um, <clears throat> is a kind. And it, it was just something that I, I wanted to to lift up. So essentially, 
you know, I, I talk about my own experiences. I, I said to lift up the magnificence of black culture, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the courage of, of black culture, but also to show the del deleterious, almost demonic, no, not almost, the demonic effect that racism has on black, black life chances. And that's why I included, um, I started the book that way, talking about Farmville, Virginia, which now is the poorest city in the state, the poorest town in the state of Virginia behind races led by Jimmy, I mean, uh, Jerry Falwell, closing the schools rather than desegregate for five long years. And as you articulated that, in as you laid that story out in the book, that was so powerful, so impacting. And it, it, it to me, the rest of the reading of the book, I, I felt that tenor coming through the book. I felt your passion. I felt your connectedness to that story. And perhaps in some way, that being the driving force for some of your scholarship in the future. Yeah. Now you dove, you, 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 you jumped all the way to the end in talking about uh, uh, white evangelical racism as lying to black Christians not just suppressing the greatness of our cultural heritage that comes through our spirituality, but literally lying to us in the way that we have, they read the scripture and have read the scripture to us, which is no new new thing. White mm -hmm. folks have been lying about the scripture to black folk ever since uh, slavery. Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, so, I'm, I mean, that's not a new, new thing, but it is in the contemporary society, I have gotten castigated for saying things like black Christians ought to come out of, white evangelical spaces that do not affirm their uniqueness, their isness, their personhood, that, that don't bring about life affirming understandings of, of, of being Christian in the world and that are antithetical to those mm -hmm. things by mm -hmm. the promotion of, as you are very explicit in the text of, uh, of, of 45 and, and, uh, and, the, and the kind of uh, those kind of things. So should, in your opinion, should black Christians come out of those white spaces? And if so, why? Yeah, um, well, uh, I guess I'm of two minds of, of, of that. I guess it depends on why they're in the, the white spaces, you know. Uh, if folk are in the white spaces, for instance, if you and I were in the white spaces, we'd be there to raise their consciousness, right, to challenge them. Sure. I think that there's a place, you know, there's a role for folk to do that. It's not something I'd want to do, but there's a... There's a place for that. But if one is there because white folks ice is, you think white folks ice is colder, you know, that's that's problematic because um, they're just going to get caught up in the, the backward hegemonic, um, uh, you know, ideological uh, thought patterns that will just keep them um, null and void Negroes and, uh, and believing in a gospel that has no liberative power at, at all. And for me, the gospel is not the gospel if it does not liberate. It, it, exactly. And that's <clears throat> that's what our struggle is today, because the way that Christianity is defined and promulgated by the mainstream is not only not liberative, but it's counter liberation. It's sure. counter revolutionary, sure. as we used to say back in the 60s, you know. Um, and and um, and that's why it's so it's it's so very dangerous because Christianity um, carries such weight in so many ways in this society, right? Um, even folk who don't profess to be Christians are, uh, you know, folk, folk <clears throat> embrace Christian some Christian notions, mm -hmm. um, you know, without without knowing it. So if you have <clears throat> A faith tradition that has become an ideological um, form, formation to keeping people <coughs> to obfuscating um, its liberative um, uh, dimension and power, then you have a people who are oppressed, right, by um, what is supposed to be a faith formulation, which is really just in a religious ideology to keep people um, uh, to. Not well these days. Not just to hold people where they are, which is what conservatism is about, but to depress their their social status uh, even more. There, there, there. 
And, and, and so, so here's here's there are questions coming through. They're breaking the rules tonight. They do it every week, but they're especially doing it with you, uh, but because they want to get some answers to some questions. I think one's been directed to me, and I'll I'll do my best to answer it. But this question came in uh, from Kendall Kirksley says, "How Kirksey, sorry, how do we reconcile the view that God is no respecter of persons, uh, race, without advocating the uniqueness?" Of black Christianity. I'm going to stab at that first and say, I think we need to read that phrase, that passage of biblical text, God being no respecter of persons, within the context in which it was written. I'm not sure that that context is applicable in terms of this kind of race dialogue in this way. But I'm going to stop at that point and I'm going to let you pick it up to correct what I said or and to address that. I'll leave the question up there. So you yeah, leave it up. yeah, Ken Lucas Kirksey is um, a Facebook. Um, friend and correspondent of, of mine, a thoughtful, uh, thoughtful young man. Um, but Black Christianity is, is, is unique um, because Black Christianity has never uh, had an oppositional dimension. In other words, Black Christianity was never about holding any particular people down, um, um, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, excluding any particular people. Um, white or mainstream Christianity, as we know, has, uh, has done that in, in multiple ways. So it is unique. Um, and it's also culturally unique. Um, in so many ways, you know, we can know that. But not only that, the black church is where so many black people um, have the opportunity to feel like somebody and be treated like somebody um, and to hold offices in which they, they'd never be able to hold any kind of office anywhere else. Um, and it's so uplifting to them. Um, and I'm, I have in mind the old deacons that I would see, they could, you know, they, many of them weren't well educated, but they were dignified. They were smart right. and right. they stood so tall and proud every Sunday. Right. Um, you know, that's in white churches, it's not going to happen in the same way. Um, and, and so, um, and not only that, our, now I can only talk about how I grew up in black church, but, you know, the old folks built up, built us up so much. Um, they knew what we had to face and they built us up and, and, and Bishop, you know, and you, you get up in front of the church and recite your piece. Remember, they called your piece. Peace, peace. That's right. And you mess it up, and they and they'd act like you had done something great. You just mess up, stand there crying, they oh babe, you doing great. That's they just right. build folk up. We don't. They will not. We don't find that that in the same culture way in, in the white church. That's why the black church is unique and uh, and important to black culture. And in my estimation, yes and amen to all of that. And we have, the black church has not only been important to that, but it's been the center of that. Yeah. We've learned public speaking. We've learned advocacy. We learned all those things within those spaces. And so uh, the question came to me, Bishop, how are white spaces defined? And when I use the term white spaces, I am talking about white evangelical churches and churches that are led predominantly by white people. But I'm also talking about spaces blacks uh, that are led by blacks that have been acculturated to the broader dominant culture who have accepted those ideologies as the preferred way of being in the world. So when I said something publicly about Tony Evans, Tony mm -hmm. Evans earned his bona fide as a pastor. I'm mm -hmm. not against Tony Evans, mm -hmm. but Tony Evans speak, speaking out against CRT as if CRT is being placed against the gospel. And his gospel reading is mainline evangelical. Yeah. I'm saying before you critique CRT in light of the gospel you preach, you need to go back and revisit the gospel. So that yeah. way you can have an authentic understanding of it before you try to critique anything else by it. So yeah, yeah. that's what I mean when I say those kind of spaces. Yeah. White spaces are spaces where black folk will lend themselves. My Our mutual friend, Dr. Lawrence Carter, the dean of the chapel at mm -hmm. my college, mm -hmm. said to me in one of my one of my one of my master's degrees is from a small mm -hmm. Southern Baptist seminary mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, predominantly white, not affirming of us at all. I went there because at that stage in my life, that's where I was. Mm -hmm. and, um, D. Carter said something to me, and I'll not forget it. He said, Jonathan, you are giving them, lending them greatness that they will neither recognize nor appreciate. Mm, no, that's that's so true. And, you know, when we talk about white spaces, I think 
you know, when I talk about whiteness, I'm talking ideologically, right? Um, an ideology of, 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 of privilege is not necessarily one of white supremacy, but it can be, but it is, uh, it is an ideology which um, everything is read through the, um, through the prism of the interests um, of, of, uh, of mainstream whites. And so, um, uh, yeah, so it's an, ide it's an ide ideological thing because there are some spaces that are liberative spaces that are almost totally white. Like in the, uh, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church, very, very, uh, they can be very progressive, you know, um, and they don't subscribe. What you know, there's no black culture there really, but they don't necessarily subscribe to um, white ideological Christianity. So I think when we talk about white spaces, we uh, this I, I, I'm thinking we're really talking about um, um, you know the main the mainstream churches. Um, uh, not the offshoots, well, we might call offshoots like Unitarians, but you know, we're talking about the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, you know, white Pentecostals on down the line, I would think. You agree? 75, yeah, 75% to 80% of the churches in the United States are either Baptist or Baptistic in their both mm -hmm. theology and ideology. And mm -hmm. that came to bear in, this, in the 2016 election, uh, mm -hmm. when 87 and the, and the 20, uh, 2020 election, in that 87% of those persons voted with the candidate that aligned himself with white evangelicalism. So those spaces are broad and ubiquitous in my ex estimation. Mm -hmm. We need to deal with them in ways that are critical, not negative, but critical. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you for being on the stream. Thank you, uh, uh, Kendall Kir Kirksey. Thank you for being on the stream tonight. I greatly appreciate it. So mm -hmm. at Dr. Dr. Hendricks, as a biblical scholar, in this text, you level a harsh critique on evangelical readings of sacred scripture. In the brief time that we have, will you help the audience, uh, our stream audience, with an understanding of perhaps some tenets as a biblical scholar for faithful reading. The reason I ask is the last three streams that we've done have been Dr. Valerie Bridgman, your friend and colleague, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on, on reading sacred scripture faithfully. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robbie Waddell, a Pentecostal scholar, white Pentecostal scholar, really fine man. Mm -hmm. We did a stream last week, Can the Bible Be Trusted? Mm -hmm. And I did a thing on Pentecostal hermeneutics last Saturday, mm -hmm. on, uh, the, hearing the voice of the spirit in the text. Mm -hmm. You level in this throughout this text. Your the premise is they're not reading the Bible right. No, they're, no. So, so this harsh critique, which I think is both fair and accurate, um, will you talk to us a little bit about what a faithful hermeneutic would look like in light of the evangelical readings yeah. that we're getting nowadays? Well, I, I, well, there, there there are two ways I want to answer, but I'm going to start with the second. And that is um, often by their own admission, they're not guided by the guy Bible. They claim to be they they, they claim to be guided by as Christians. Wow. Um, they um, so oh, I believe I don't recall the exact number, but I do quote it in the book. It's some eighty percent or more of uh, evangelical Christians say that their attitude toward immigrants is not guided by the Bible. Right. And yes, and we know that's the case because they're so so vile and vicious and ugly about it. So 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 the first part of the, so the second part of my answer, of course, again, is that they're not guided by the, the Bible. They're ideological Christians who are guided by their interests. They sacralize their own interests. And it's almost like like they are worshiping uh, themselves They make an idol out of their interests. Right. And that's not Christianity. That's the antithesis of Christianity or anti-Christianity. Um, but um, I, I think they miss out. They, and be, they ignore what the gospel says so clearly. Jesus said that the two main commandments, the two primary commandments, obviously he said it, it's in black and white. Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, one is vertical, one's horizontal. You can't have a cross without both of them. He says that, and so you know, um, and the only proof of loving God told us it, um, it, it, it is 
how we act in the world, really, when you get down to it. And so, and 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 so they they ignore that the first commandment in terms of how we should live in the world is to try at least to love our neighbors as ourselves, to try to want equality uh, of opportunity and security and life chances. I mean, that's basic. So they ignore that, but that is, that must be the primary um, portal through which a, a, a Christian um, enters into the faith. That must be the number one way, uh, number one thing on a Christian's mind is trying to love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because the man you say is your savior said that's number one. Number two, the only real mode of judgment that we get in the Bible for our behavior is Matthew 25, 31 through 46, the separation of the sheep and the goats. It says that those who um, show love for their neighbors by trying to make sure they have enough food to eat, they have shelter. In other words, um, try to show love by making sure that they have a decent life um, that those will go to the right hand, will go to heaven, eternal life. And those who do not care about others, who don't try to make a difference, ignore their needs and all that, that they'll go to the left hand to eternal, uh, to eternal damnation. That's my paraphrase. But, but that doesn't, so that's, that's how, that's what is supposed to be our guiding ethics of the faith. That should be guiding our actions, certainly our public policies, our church policies. And this is the hermeneutic. The mo this, this is the uh, in interpretive lens that I think that is not just my opinion, but but uh, a, a close read of the gospel sort of dictates this, if, if, is, is, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But they do not hold that. These right-wing Pentecostals, they don't. Why? Because race, white supremacist sensibilities and control is what is most important to them. And what the gospel actually calls them to do um, is, is greatly secondary. They are part of a big club that mm. looks out for its club members and, and pays much less attention to the bylaws, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> sure, sure. Some would, and, and some would say, and I've heard them say it to me, as a matter of fact, the most recent one I heard say it is that uh, in describing the condition of some of our brothers and sisters, that they didn't follow after the mandates of scripture. They're there because of their own uh, inattention to the gospel imperative. So they're there because of their own inattention to A, B, C, or D. And it's and and um, I was very disconcerted that um, this guiding ethic of the faith that you describe uh, is is not the lens. I think that it's. But because it's it's the reading of the text, but it's also the lens through which we read the text. Yes, exactly. That exactly. becomes a part of the hermeneutical exercise in deriving what is the spirit saying to the church right now in this text. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Well, it, may I, if I might add another? Sure. Um, and you know, as you know, I have a whole chapter on this, and that is that um, the foundational. Biblical ethic, guiding ethic, or yeah. hermeneutic, is justice. Justice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Justice, the term justice, Ms. Pratt is used more than any other ethical term throughout the Bible. Uh, second to that is sadaqah, uh, translated as righteousness often, but it means much more than that. It means doing right or, or doing or acting justly in society. You put them two together. Uh, and and by the way, they are the most off-occurring pairing of terms throughout the Bible, Mishpat and Sadaqah. You put them together, that gives you social justice, Ooh. basic, foundational, as the hermeneutic through which everything is supposed to be refracted. And when you go through the, uh, you go through the Hebrew Bible, of course, you know there there are a lot of things happening there, but but over but but overarching it is this um, social justice ethic, which talks about throughout the Bible, taking care of the vulnerable, the poor, the hungry. But it also says that those who are in positions of power and authority and governance, who, who run the government have, government, have the responsibility yeah. Yeah. to take care of the poor. Now, in those days, it was the princes and kings. 
uh, who are in governance. Now we have elected officials, but the responsibility is the same. And this must be taken into account in this in this hermeneutical um, in, interpretive uh, prism that we use, a framework that we use. But they don't do that at all. That's right. In fact, right. remember what's his name? John MacArthur had this this put this letter out that said that social social gospel, social gospel social justice is not the gospel yes that it's and that it's the antithesis of the gospel i mean you, you can't be any more wrong than that and ten thousand um pastors. evangelicals and pa no ten thousand pastors co-signed it ten thousand pastors co-signed something that's backward and stupid and deleterious and harmful and destructive as that this is a pitiful time brother really it, it is, is. It is. And your voice being raised and amplified in this season is, I believe, what the spirit is calling for with all the necessary persecutions that come along with it. But the truth of the matter is, as you have given by way of articulation there of John MacArthur uh, out in California, I mean, he's been he has he has fought against everybody that's not like him. You know, he's yep. written books against strange fire. He wrote against Pentecostals. He wrote, you know, all the, it, 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 so he's just been, he's, but that again is the, that's white normativity, middle-aged white male mm -hmm. normativity. And yeah. that's the standard by which many of them gauge the, uh, an appropriate hermeneutic and reading of the text. That's what the text means because mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it aligns with their particular, that particular standard. And mm. I think the thing that has been so the genius of your book, as has been your pattern of biblical hermeneutics in the previous writings, and that is to expose a deeper historical critical reading of the text. And as a Pentecostal, I have some some different readings. I'm more of a reader response critic and mm. and uh and the kind of world in front of the text. Um I believe that the text is is alive and and, and that the spirit is still animating the text and mm. that there are layers of meaning. But I found your book so incredibly helpful. Uh, and I found your book so incredibly helpful because of the the way that you were faithful to the language of the day, the emphases that came out in the text, which is why I am advocating for everybody to purchase. The link is in the stream below. If you missed my previous admonition, uh, like, share, subscribe, tag, do something that promotes the channel, but also go into the description below and purchase Christians Against Christianity. The link is there. Yes, if you click on that link, you can go on Amazon if you want, but if you click that link, it benefits the channel. Doesn't cost you any more, but it does benefit the channel. If you go on Amazon on your own and do it, you can purchase the book. It won't benefit the channel, but I'm asking you to do that uh, through the link that's provided below. And uh, two of Dr. Hendrick's other books are there as well. Please, ma'am, please, sir, make it a priority. I'm asking you to do two things tonight. One is purchase at least one of his books from the link that's there on the, in the in the description. And I'll give you an opportunity to sow directly into the live stream later on in the stream before we close out tonight. The, the reason that I think it's so important to talk about this hermeneutical piece is because that's the big rub. And that's the thing that you point out in the book. The whole idea of Christians against Christianity has as its substratum the injurious hermeneutics with which they read the text. Yeah, 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 but um, yeah, when they read the text, um, yeah, when when they, yeah, but they read, they, they read the text, they don't read the text from a perspective of love or justice, as Richard Pryor put it, it's more like just us, you know, that's sure. not, <laughs> they read, and we need to, we need to point, uh, we need to point that out because, uh, a lot of you know, people, black and white, um, you know, haven't had the opportunity to to be exposed to the to the kinds of critical um, uh, reading and knowledge that some of us uh, have, and so you know, it's 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 important to to let to, to give them a different perspective. You know, um, sure. I I um I I had uh, an aunt, wonderful woman. I. Uh, she died several years ago, um, but uh, you know when when your your elders are always your elders. And I came to her. I had published uh, um, an annotated uh, an annotated commentary, yes, in the Oxford Annotated Bible on the Gospel of John, and and, and it was the first time a black person had done had done that. And I was proud. I went went to her and I said, Adi, um, 
I uh, I like I want to show you this. I, I you know I was coming to it almost like a like a little boy again, and, and you know I did this. Um, I I, uh, I I published this annotated um, commentary on the Gospel of John, and you know she was a big Christian, and she said, "Oh, it's nice, but I like Jerry Falwell's Bible better." And you know I I, I realized, and she meant no harm. Sure. Um, she didn't know any better. And so that's part of, of what I struggle with. That's why I'm so glad, I'm so thrilled about um, global Pentecostal perspectives because our struggle really is to raise the consciousness of, of, of our people because mainstream Christianity is um, in many ways is not good for sure. uh, children and other living things. <sighs> it's not about life, it's about control, um, often it's about death. Right now, there, there's a lot of death dealing going on um, in these right-wing evangelicals. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And the, 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 the child able to to call, make that clarion call, and put that out there for the people. It's just oh, it's so it's 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 Herculean. The the, the, the task is Herculean, but we're here to do it, and you're here with us on tonight, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, uh, one of our friends and scholars, uh, uh, has, has uh, Andre Price is asking, has Black uh, Christians' em embrace of sola scriptura contributed to Black Christians' embrace of white hermeneutics? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, you know, uh, the way that we understand the nature of the Bible, yeah, has, has, has been problematic because, you know, I can remember um, well, I did it myself years ago. You know, hey, the Spirit's going to guide me. I just open the Bible, and the Spirit will guide me to open it to the page and put my finger on the on the verse that 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 helped me. And um, you know, we we um, I it wasn't until I was grown that I heard anything about um, critical or 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 insightful analytical reading of, of of the Bible. So yeah, I mean, many folk just think that the Bible is one book. Um, and that right. And right. They have no no sense of um, uh, of, the, of the fact that we have sixty six different books, um, most of them in, written in different settings, if not all of them, right? Didn't, and some of them written thousands of years apart, and all that. And that we can't just take a bald reading of it. Um, but many of people do that. Um, not only that. You know, so many, so many folk are in love with the, the King James Version, which, you know, it's it sounds poetic. I mean, it has 6,000 translation mistakes in it, that's for sure. But not but not only that, I mean, those car, car, uh, car, car, archaic words, the meaning of those archaic words are not, means not clear. Right. So for us. Right. Words I mean, evolution. It says, you know, like, man, come on. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you had all these obstacles to making any sense of, of the scripture and to just think that you can just, you know, um, pick up the book and read something and get the full gist of it. Um, it you know, it's, it's, it's sort of self-defeating for, for our people. But, but, yeah, we see it as scripture alone. We don't need any other thing, anything right. else to, to help us understand. And that's, that's a real problem. And you're right. It's, it, it holds us back to a great extent. That challenge of sola scriptura, as well as this idea of the um, the uh, paralleling of the inscripturated word with the person and work of Jesus, as mm -hmm. if they are on par one with the other. I've heard recently, both in preachment and in live uh, live stream commentary, uh, the equation of Jesus with the Bible. Mm. who are on par one with the other. And, and you would be surprised, you wouldn't be surprised. Many may be surprised by the number of people, and there are some that are on the stream tonight that will equate the two. Well, didn't John 1, 1 said, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh. And what, yeah, the word, not the Bible became flesh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. obviously John wasn't talking about the Bible that we know today. The Bible that we have today wasn't even written when John said that. So yeah. Yeah. I, that whole idea of the equation Make it to shifting from a trinity or, or even a oneness perspective to a to at least a, a you know a quartet you know father son holy spirit and bible yeah uh, right. you know yeah. 
Yeah, so the Bible can't be perfect. Only God's perfect. Exactly. And now that we're reading it in a different language, you know, um, and so, I mean, and that's another thing that's frustrating for me because when I read it in its original language, it's like, man, it had some, some of it has such different meanings than um, some of the translations we use. And then you get the paraphrases, like paraphrase Bibles, like the Amplified the and all these. Bible. Huh? The dentist office Bible. Yeah, man, which is really somebody's opinion of what they think the, the text said. And people use, what, there's the Amplify. What else? There's all kinds of. Good news for modern man. Um, and then there's others. They shouldn't. And they should, they just leave the King James and go to the New Revised Standard or the NIV <laughs> or something, you know. Yeah, I advocate against the NIV. It's the nearly inspired version. All I'm saying is, is that yeah, I do too. I'm not for it either. Yeah. NRSV is, seems to be a faithful translation or more faithful. But the thing that, and, and this is the kind of eggheaded, nerdy, scholarly stuff that pushes us to one end of the conversation, and that is to say that every interp every translation involves an act of interpretation, and interpretation can't be done outside of context. And part of the challenge is that the church contemporarily is historically an amnesic and theologically anemic. So we, we, we lack two main pillars for biblical interpretation. And that's all this egghead kind of stuff. So for, for um, uh, uh, my challenge is to challenge the pastors and preachers and leaders and ministers on this stream tonight. My challenge for each of them is to, to go deeper, to go further to invest yourself more in the study and 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 the hard work the heavy lifting of the kind of uh, seminary and graduate school work and undergraduate work that will that will and I'm not saying that God can't use somebody to preach or teach or mm -hmm. prophesy without formal education but what I am saying is the complexities of problems that we're dealing with today, like the January 6th insurrection, like this inexplicable beholdenness to a totally immoral man bereft of Christianity or any Christian principles mm -hmm. in life at all, mm -hmm. yet he garners 87% of the Christian vote. These complexities require those that are faithfully, yeah, yeah. rightly divided the word. And who are serious about uh, uh, about study. You know, it's... it's uh... <sighs> Ministers in general can be often are I I I, I mean this descriptively and I don't mean this in uh, to be offensive but you know pastors can be some of the most backward folk we run into they don't read the newspaper and I mean but I shouldn't say I mean uninformed I don't I shouldn't say backward uh, that you know so many don't read the newspaper sure. or they'll you know they read some lightweight um, they don't they don't take time to understand the economic forces that that are uh, assailing our people um you know and, and and if this thing is so what this thing that we're involved in here with the church can have the power of life and death and we have to approach it that seriously and i think that's what i hear you saying bishop Absolutely. We have to approach it that seriously. That means don't, you know, don't sit around and talk about, uh, you know, all kinds of foolishness. You, you know, if you particularly full time pastors, well, then be full time, man. You should be studying all the time, reading all the time. Right. How can you really serve and save your flock if you don't know what's going on? That that is that is killing them. And so many of them don't. And also in seminaries, don't always prepare. They Absolutely. Don't. Absolutely. You know? I mean, we should understand what capitalism is, what socialism is. We should be conversant. We should be thinking. And one other thing, I don't want to get carried away. One other thing. We get carried about, away, Reverend. When we talk about vision, um, without vision, our people perish. Well, what vision, what vision is the church giving folk for the kind of world that we want? Right. The kind of economy that, that we want. What kind of body politic? We want what kind of um, educational system do do we want? I mean, you know, the way that is con is configured and all that. We're supposed to have. We talk about vision so much, and we talk about building a new world. Well, then we have to start really talking about 
and preparing ourselves be able to, to be to, to, to talk about these things and to take them seriously or at least know that that's what we're supposed to be doing so many don't even think about that kind of thing they think about from week to week and that doesn't do much for 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 people it changes the way they feel but not not doesn't change their lives and it oftentimes it reinforces the kind of uh, the yes. kind of self destructive feelings that that self the, the, what I tell people all the time is a, a lot of black people have a self hatred pathology that's reinforced through the preachment that we receive because Ooh. many of them many of our pastors and I'm, I'm I I like you I am a pastor I'm a I'm a scholar pastor so I have one foot in the academy and one foot in the parish and that is that straddling is oftentimes quite uncomfortable yeah. but the truth of the matter is is that when we don't possess the necessary intellectual scaffolding to get to those places, to be able to view the landscape, see what's coming on the horizon, yeah. and be able to warn the people, then we are derelict in our duty. And yeah. it's not because some of us don't. Like I've used this as an example. One of the things that has been challenging for me is so many of my colleagues as pastors, you're talking about spending time, full-time pastors, spending time reading, spending time in the text, spending time in scholarly and intellectual and spiritual pursuit. And most of us are trying to find resources that cut down our time. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, like this Bible software, the, one of the most popular Bible software out there amongst pastors is Logos Bible software. Now, while mm -hmm. I'm all about technology, obviously so, I'm doing a live stream. My junk looks good. You know why? Because I'm technologically savvy. My junk sounds mm -hmm. good. I can integrate this because I'm technologically savvy. So, so haters don't hate. But here's the thing. The problem is, is that if you've got Logos Bible software, doing all the scriptural connections, making uh, recommendations uh, for the for the kind of uh, the kind of commentaries and the kind of and, and you're not doing the background to be able to see what what theological vantage point this this commentary comes from or reading this person's translation, not recognizing that there is implied interpretation in every translation right, right. and not not being man or woman enough yourself to do the hard work, sweat the bullets of learning the original languages mm -hmm. and getting in there or getting under somebody that is faithful in their interpretation to be able to help you with that. Right. I think that is a big hermeneutical challenge. And I want and all of our churches, you can't get up there dumb no more because your people got Google. They're sitting in the pews with a cell phone and sitting on the other end of the live stream with, with blue letter Bible. And they're looking to see whether or not what your, your concordance <laughs> definition is actually the right the definition. So you address hermeneutical approaches faithful hermeneutics as the substratum to preserving authentic Christianity. Yeah. And I believe that, it. I mean, the, the, in the book, you talked about our inordinate relationship with guns and the gun lobby. Mm -hmm. And as, and I've got to admit, I'm, you know, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an enthusiast. I'm a sports shooter. I, you know, I'm, I'm a part, I'm a card carrying member of the NRA. I was reading that going, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, but those kind of things, uh, you talked about the church's relationship and antithetical relationship to right-wing evangelicalism with the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. the, the kinds of things that a more faithful, deeper reading of the text, even our stances, our age-old stance against women in yes. ministry, a faithful reading of the text will provide at least another perspective. Yes. And not, uh, and not this kind of uh, this kind of stratification of power. So mm -hmm. I, I, that was such an important thing to me. And someone already asked on here, uh, what is the best book? He said the New Revised Standard Version. The NRSV is a faithful translation. I have my congregations reading from the New King James Version, mm -hmm. particularly because my wife and I have the hermeneutical tools to be able to sift through uh, the, uh, the some of the errant, pa errant passages. Uh, I'm working on with Peter N's work right now on biblical inerrancy. And, mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm going to be doing some stuff on that in the future. Pray for me. Uh, but, but your historical analysis, not only your biblical hermeneutical analysis, but your historical analysis of the evangelical church's complicity with racism in this book was scathing. Mm. Uh, how do you, what, uh, what can you, what will you, I just want to throw that out there. My reading of your text you brought us through some historical trajectory, helping us see how complicit white evangelical, right-wing evangelical racism has been interwoven into the fabric of what we call contemporary Christianity in the West. 
for you. What are your thoughts? What do we need to be saying to black Christians concerning this history of, of complicit behavior? <clears throat> well, I think we need to be uh, exposing it uh, for, for them. Um, um, <clears throat> I didn't know, I knew there was a sordid history and a sordid re relationship between white racism um, and the, the church um, and, and the modern uh, evangelical, right-wing evangelical movement. But I, I didn't even know how bad it was, Doc. I, I tell, mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we need to let folk know so so they can be on, on their guard. Um, <clears throat> our people need to know that in mainstream Christianity, there is a stratum of race of racism that is inextricable. Wow. And it wow. goes to the way they read the Bible. Wow. Uh, wow. The way that they uh, in, interpret the Bible, it goes to the way that they respond to, uh, to social uh, events and movements uh, and how they respond to us. Um, and, it's not just the Mexicans that they think of as ra as rapists and murderers. It's black folks too. It's the otherization of anybody that's not white. Exactly, and it's and the demonization of them, um, uh, making them into in, into demons. And so um, this modern, you know, evangelical movement since the seventies, eighties. Um, it started in racism. Its roots are in racism. Its roots are in the uh, when when uh, Jimmy Carter's administration said that you know you can't be a um, a racially discriminatory um, educational institution and, and still get aid from from the and still get uh, aid from the government or get a tax um, uh, get a tax relief from from the government um, and that's basic. Really, you would think. Well, the evangelicals, Jerry Falwell and them went. They went. They went mad. That's I Bob mean, Jones University. Bob Jones, exactly. The Bob Jones University case. They went. They went crazy, and you know. And Bob Jones said, "No, we think we should have the right to uh, to to be racist, and uh, and and also to get money from the government." And the white evangelical movement, that's when that movement began. And it didn't begin with Roe versus Wade, like they said. It what began in, in, uh, in, in white supremacist racism and discrimination against black folks. Okay, I have to stop you now because you have brought in an extraordinarily important point. The obfuscation of the real issue. Mm -hmm. That's the real problem. Mm -hmm. Because white evangelical racism, or white evangelicalism, tends to hang its hat on two pillars, gay marriage mm -hmm. and abortion, mm -hmm. which obfuscates some of the real issues that are going on. You address that in the text. I yeah. want to hear your, perhaps some of your, your, your kind of off the cuff thoughts about that. You brought in the idea of Roe v. Wade, but mm -hmm. I, I think that that's such a worthy exploration and this kind of obfuscated, what's the, what's the real issue? Let's not yeah. Just yeah. Talk yeah. The real issue is um, white Christian supremacist domination of this country. Um, uh, our brother at Dar Dartmouth, oh, um, Randy Balmer, his book, Thy Kingdom Come, right? I know that you're familiar with it. Um, Randy Balmer was in the room when those top white ring, uh, top right wing evangelicals came together trying to decide what wedge issues could they use that would best get people on their side so they could dominate American society. And they decided, well, we'll use Roe versus Wade, uh, 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 abortion, and homosexuality, right? Sure. What's so interesting is that previous to that, the Southern Baptist Convention and so many right-wing evangelicals supported Roe versus Wade. Initially, they did for years. A Southern Baptist Convention issued oh, three um, three statements, three declarations supporting it. Well, when these people came together and decided what their wedge issues would be that would help them take over American society, 
they say it'll be abortion and homosexuality. And that is um and that is what they they they're using to distract everybody. But they're also but they have they distorted Christianity because you have Millions of people thinking that these are the most important issues for Christians. Jesus oh, never says a word about either thing, oh, about abortion or, or Roe v. Wade. And the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, doesn't say anything about a, abortion. Uh, a the only voluntary abortion it talks about in the Bible is Numbers 5, and that is God aborts a fetus of a woman talks about boarding the fetus of a, of, a, of an unfaithful wife who's gotten pregnant by someone other than her husband. That one might call that. I won't even get into that. But the point is, the text doesn't even talk ab about it. Exodus, you know, twenty one, uh, verse twenty to twenty three, just doesn't talk about voluntary abortions. When a woman gets injured and her and 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 the the fetus is aborted. This eye for an eye for her, but it's only a financial a fine for killing the fetus. So the Bible doesn't get into that. But these people have us thinking that it's more important That's than loving your neighbor, more important than feeding poor folk, more important than making sure children are safe. Um, it's it's just it's it's they have. That's why I I call I say that right wing evangelicalism is. Um, is imbued with um, with a spirit of antichrist because wow. what they're teaching is the is the antithesis of the gospel. Wow. Anti just means against Christian against Christ's teachings, um, and and we have to really call that out. But underlying it all, you can never forget is racism, because no matter how much you come on their side. With homophobia or um, or abortion obsession, black folks still are not going to be accepted. The black community is still not going to be accepted as a fully human by them. That's a scary and and um, scary notion and a um, and 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 a kind of fatalistic uh, view. What? Yeah, I, that saddens me. But I, it, partly because I, I tend to, I'm 55. You know, I was born in 1965. I was raised under, under a pastor who was very uh, emboldened us very much so for social activism. And so I've heard these kinds of things, and I have always held out hope for what we went through in the 1980s. This notion of racial reconciliation. Till my sister Yolanda Pierce pulled me to the side and said, Jonathan, you know. Part of what we need to understand about reconciliation, for something to be reconciled, it has to first be conciled. Yeah. Black folk, white folk, white Christians have, have never even been together from the exactly. get-go. Exactly. And so, they've shown no uh, no interest in getting together. Not in any large, not, not, not any large, to any large degrees, not to any large parts. And the only time that I have found there's this genuine attempt or or idea of let's come together, it's, it's always been under our rubric, under our rules, seeing life our way yeah. with an understanding of this. So 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 um I'm reading, you know, Kwame Bidiako's work from from Ghana uh and talking about the real Christianity that comes out of Africa. Because Christianity of course is a, a Afro Hebraic construct. It has it's imbued with African sensibilities. Yeah. So yeah. I'm reading an African theologian's understanding of that now mm -hmm. because in some ways I want to rechristinate Christianity to a way of understanding and being in the world that's imbued with some sensibilities that are more communal, mm -hmm. imbued with some more sensibilities that deal with, I mean, uh, Mishvat and Tzedakah mm -hmm. and Yakosune are biblical terms, mm -hmm. but the, that but that sense of ma'at mm -hmm. in Africa, that sense of, of justice and mm -hmm. fair, yeah. and mm -hmm. equitable distribution, equitable understandings of life that I believe were deeply embedded in, in, in the gospels and Jesus's words and actions I think absolutely. With, with with a sense of the the sensibility of Maat. No, I, I, absolutely. And I tried to, you know, point that out in talking about the focus of a uh, uh, the 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 dyadic cultural focus of the of the folk. In other words, people were concerned with the common good, with community. Yeah. yeah. Maat talks about that. Almost every traditional 
uh, society uh, talked about that. You know, of course, um, it was the coming of the of the of the, the capitalist age, which really um, injected this sense of individualism. Sure. And, and that's another problem with white Christianity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Individualism yeah. and exceptionalism, as they call. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that individualism. <clears throat> note the, the almost no text. I, the, the, the the later text. I don't know, like the. Um, First, Second Timothy, and Titus is a little different, but most texts, virtually all the biblical texts, were about they focus on the common good, they focus on community, not on, sure. on into uh, individualism. And 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 if one doesn't understand that, if one reads the Bible through the capitalist lens, you cannot understand what that's what that's all about. It's about the common good. That's why. Loving neighbor as yourself has such profound political and economic and social implications because mm. it's about if the whole community is healthy, then we're all healthy. But no, we have this individualism, which is reflected in their lingo. They talk about biblical freedom, biblical freedom, freedom. The main biblical ethic is responsibility for others, not freedom from it. Right. You know, they have it all. Bass awkward as 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 they That's say. What my daddy would say. That's what my yeah. daddy would say. <laughs> I'd say it different if I wasn't on this on this podcast. But you know, that's it, it's they got it all all wrong, brother. And that's why we need to come out, come out of that, come out, out of their churches and out of their mindset. And I don't mean I'm not being racist. I'm I'm talking about getting where we can really a space where we can where we have some basis to really embrace the gospel because mainstream white churches are too individualistic and they will never really be able to get to the core as long as they're still talking about freedom, 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 and 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 uh, and not talking about responsibility, responsibility, responsibility. Man, you got me wound up tonight. Are, yes and amen, man. I had the spirit. This is the spirit. I say, listen, my daddy used to say that. That's that's bass awkward. So he used to say, Tell you what, and this they put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> but uh, but I, I say that to you to say that uh listen, if you're deriving any value at all out of tonight's stream, and I can see by your uh comment commentary coming up in the stream here that you are. Um the 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 books are in Denise, the books are in the chat. I mean, in the description, go down there, the links, the Amazon links, just click on the links. You can see it, um, all of them in the, uh, in the uh, all the Dr. Hendricks books that I put up tonight with, the, with one exception, that, uh, one notable exception. Uh, but Christians Against Christianity is what we're talking about tonight. And much of what we're saying, much of what, uh, what he is saying in, in, in a truncated way is, is in a protracted way in the text. And so you can hear it, read it, hear his rationale, hear his hermeneutic. Read his uh, uh, the historical underpinnings of it in a more protracted, in a, in a fuller uh, way. Uh, and I want to encourage you to do so. I told you I was going to ask you to do two things tonight. The first is everybody needs to go on and uh, everybody needs to to purchase at least one of the resources that are in the stream. Do me that favor. Purchase one of the things. It'll, it'll edify you. It'll make you more faithful and equipped to be able to do the work that you're assigned unto. And it will it will help the channel. And uh, uh, when you buy the, uh, uh, the scholars' books, that's, that's one of the streams of income. Let's bless uh, Dr. Hendricks on tonight as well. He doesn't get a salary for coming on with me. I do this as a labor of love. And uh, I get friends and colleagues to take a chance on me and come on. On and uh, and he's doing so on tonight. I'm going to send him something to take his wife to dinner on, but you'll help me do that if you buy a book and you'll help me tonight. If this has been of any value to, to you tonight, it would be great if I had a hundred people on tonight that would just give a $20 seed to, to the, to the, uh, to the stream on tonight that would just say, Hey, this is valuable to me. I want to be able to see more and more of this. I've got Alicia Lola Jones uh, in the queue, ready to come on the stream uh, awesome. next month for the first awesome. of the year. I've got uh, I've got um, uh, Jermaine Marshall, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Jermaine Marshall, and his new book Christianity Corrupted, uh, uh, just pu published on Orbis Press, is coming mm -hmm. out on the stream with me. Uh, my my Morehouse brother, Dr. Robert Michael Franklin, and I talked several months ago, so he's queued up and ready to come on the stream with us. So we've got we want to bring some of the 
best and brightest, some of the most insightful thinkers and most uh, prolific authors to be able to, to help us uh, uh, navigate a course through these difficult and tumultuous waters mm -hmm. that we're navigating in this hour. And I believe by our, our spirituality, by our uh, uh, affinity to the to how the spirit is active and 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 uh, how the spirit moves in the midst of us and how we receive uh, her gifts and her callings and her her animation of our lives. I believe that Pentecostals, Charismatics, Renewalists have an opportunity in this hour to lead the way. And I believe that if we are faithful in our reading of the text as the Spirit guides us, and I believe that if we are sensitive to the voice of the Spirit as she speaks to us in this hour, that we'll be able to be of significant force in bringing not only this country, country right, but perhaps Western Christianity mm -hmm. right. Pentecostalism is the fastest growing spirituality, Christian spirituality around the planet. It's mm -hmm. transposability and ubiquity that flows into other religious traditions. Yeah. That there are many points of intersection, lots of dialogue points with other faith traditions, so that when we stop majoring on what separates us and start majoring on what connects us as human beings and as all children of, of, of the Most High God and people for whom Jesus died. So I want to just encourage you to support us in that way. If you will do so by liking, sharing, subscribing, purchasing a book, get at least one book and make at least one offering. Now, if you got to choose between a book and an offering, <laughs> buy a book. <laughs> I've got a guest on tonight. If you got to choose between a book and an offering, buy a book. Uh, and uh, but seriously, in all seriousness, I, I just I want to thank you all for being on with us on tonight. I'm not done. They're they're raising questions now. Uh, last thing, uh, uh, last few things. I'm gonna throw up these questions here uh, or statements. Uh, Dr. Ray Mooring said this, and, and you can riff off of any of these, uh, 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 Dr. Hendricks. Uh, they've taken their refusal to love neighbors as themselves to the next level. That's why they'd rather get COVID than wear a mask or get a jab to save a neighbor's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, my, my response to that is, and I talk about in the, that in the book, and I, I talk about it in, in relation to libertarianism. I won't go into that now. But um, again, it comes down to not having a sense of uh, loving neighbor, having a sense of, of community. Um, it's it's this you know I have the freedom to do what I want, and and no real biblical believer who understands the, the scriptures as uh, in, in context would ever say anything like that. Um, so they they do not understand the demands of the faith and this freedom stuff. I'm free to do what I want. You know, I have the freedom. No, that's just a bunch of bull, man. You know, it's just, it's it's not Christian and uh, it's not even humane. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. What, I haven't heard you say much about this and I don't want to put you on the spot because I know I, none of none of what I've read of yours. Well, some of it does. Um, but but perhaps, perhaps you want to comment on this idea of the African nature of the origins of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Your awesomeness. But uh, that's another great Morehouse man. Uh, uh, DC is another Morehouse man. Uh, okay. that, uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, put the question back up, please. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Bishop talks about that about that a lot. But I, I also, um, I mean, I, I I taught a course on uh, August Wilson's uh, Century Cycle plays, right? Um, and it's so brilliant, and he uses African religion so so much. And um, and in preparing for that, and using my classmate Yvonne Chirot's book, that I'm, I think you, I know you're familiar with her book, um, and and uh, and the late Al Rabito, who we just laid to rest. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, slave religion. You know, um, it, it's it's you see all these these uh, uh, all these Africanities and uh, all of these uh, African retentions. In, uh, in in Christian practice, um, and um, so yeah, I I I firmly believe that, uh, and culturally, I mean, you you see you see a lot of it, uh, re, you know, retentions and and the way that they constitute community and all that, and uh, so yeah, I mean, what we have here is European European uh, Christianity, um, and we need to leave it alone. And uh, we need to call it what it is. It's European wow. humanity, I mean, Christianity. And it is not what black Christianity has been. Ours has been 
based on love and community. And theirs, I'm speaking generally now, has not been based on that. We know it's obvious anyone who reads of the first page of the American story knows that that's the truth. Sure, sure. I'm just, you know, there are those that are on uh, on the stream tonight and those that will hear this and will be influenced by that, that will will ask the question of, of what of um, this idea of every race, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, all peoples of the planet, all peoples of the world coming together in, in under the banner of Christ. Um, what, what hope, what, uh, what eschatological vision do you have for us? Because I'm, I, and I, sh- I, I don't ask that as if I have a different point of view. I, I too, um, you know, I had Calvin Warren on here and Dr. Calvin Warren is a, a, talked about ontological terror, uh, uh, black ontological terror. We've been terrorized just by, by our isness is terrorized, but he's a nihilist and he, he's, he does not offer any hope. And it mm-hmm. kind of got under my skin because I am, I am, I am eternally optimistic for, for, yeah. uh, for what the, the transforming power of, of the spirit. But I'm also realistic enough to say this is where we are right now. Yeah. Call us into some more life affirming spaces, educate us in ways that transform our thinking. Mm. What say to you to any eschatological futuristic hope that we well, may have? You know, I am. Um... I'm not real hopeful um, about racism. I, I mean, we recognize things have changed greatly in the last century, the last 50 years, for sure. Um, you know, I was born in segregation, and you know, I've and I've been able to, to to walk in the spaces that you know none of my forebears could have imagined. I'm able able to do it because of them, but they couldn't imagine doing it themselves. So, I mean, I I think things will get better, but I think that they'll. I think that we have seen in these last three or four years that um, there is much more racism and, and hatred in this nation than I thought sure. still existed. And sure. I think it always exists because this country was, was based on white supremacy and there are people who are going to always have this exceptionalist, triumphalist view. Um, but I also think that as long as, as, as Christians pay too much attention to Paul's uh, Paul uh, wrote. Uh, is it in Philippians when he <clears throat> when he um, apparently quotes a uh, a hymn about every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Um, that's a triumphalism that is. I don't think we hear something like that come out of the mouth of Jesus because you know that's that's. That's a tri- it's not only a triumphalist, but it's sort of dominationist too. You know, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And we, you know, we have to start taking this out of our out, out of the faith, you know, um, and start really focusing on on the egalitarianism of love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, and I don't see that happening because so many people come to the faith not really wanting. It's almost like coming for a to a vending machine to get something that that they need, some comfort or or affirmation or something, but coming to be part of a movement mm. to make this a, a just world, to you know, to, to be the kind of world Jesus said spirits upon him to bring new good good news to the, the poor. I mean, he was a herald of a whole new uh, of a whole new dispensation, but but also a critic of the uh, prevailing. Um, system. Um, how many folks come to the church looking to be a part of that? So what am I what I'm saying? I'm saying that I don't see anything else to do but keep struggling day to day to try to make a difference. But I have no idea where it's going, Doug. I'm just not that optimistic that white America is going to ever become completely hum, uh, humane or that the church is going to really stand up and be the kind of bulwark Against injustice and fighter, fighter for justice that it's called to be. I'm, I'm just sorry. I, I hope I'm not right, but that's I've, I I've been making me feel different. You know. I hear you, and I mean I appreciate your, your both your candor and I respect the, your view. I mean you've 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 been viewing this for seven decades plus, and uh, this is uh, this is I think that part of the reality of 
of uh, at least the authenticity that I want the people of, uh, of the stream to be able to hear. I want us to be able to grapple with that. I think your description of the kind of moralistic therapeutic deism that most people operate in um, rather than Christianity. They, they Can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you? I got to, brother. I'm trying to figure out who does he remind me of? You remind me more of Jeremiah Wright. You're the third person in Anybody the Anybody I've ever met. Century. Brother, because of your erudition, you really are, your, your, your art, uh, the degree of your articulateness, man, and, and the, the depth of your, um, your thought, the incisiveness of your thought, and the breadth of your thought. You are just yeah. Jeremiah Wright, and plus you look like him when he was in. <laughs> So, I'm bright skinned. They say in the South, I'm bright skinned. <laughs> I got uh, uh, Well, that's that's high cotton. Thank you. Well, that's it's true, brother. It's that's true. a compliment of compliments. Thank you for saying that. That means a great deal to me. It does. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah Wright is is an icon of our of our generation. I'm just, yes, I'm just grateful. But you two are one of our luminaries, and I say of you, long live, long live, Obery Hendricks Jr. Mm -hmm. Keep living and writing. Keep informing and and uh, inspiring, keep digging and unearthing, keep challenging and grading against the sensibilities that have that have lulled us into complacency and given us a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. Keep on provoking us, but we need it. I'm grateful for each and every one of you that are on this stream tonight. Again, like it, share it, tag somebody, subscribe. I, I, I saw you. I see you, Lois. Thank you. Give Doug, Doug my love. I'm so happy to see you on tonight. Thank you for your consistent love and support. I greatly appreciate uh, Lois Olina and Doug Olina, a couple uh, from the Society for Pentecostal Studies, and friends of mine that are just mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful people of God. Thank you. I see you on there. I see so many of you on there. Yeah, that, that's right, babe. You heard that. And my wife said, that's a high compliment. She's from right. Chicago. So she it's grew real. up on my right, yeah. So it's real. Uh, Sister, you got somebody, you know, you you, all, you you got quite a man there. I gotta right. give it to you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. But I'm Thanks. I'm grateful for each of you all coming on again by at least one of the three uh Aubrey Hendricks Jr. books that are on that are in the description on tonight. All you gotta do is go down to the description, click, and you'll see them. Uh, also down there is um is uh, Anthea Butler's White Evangelical Racism uh, is also down there. If you don't have it in your library, you need it in your library. You need to read it. Start with Christians Against Christianity. They'll read it so you'll have a, a fully orbed understanding of our dialogue on tonight. Um, uh, 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 also, if it wouldn't, it, I just want to challenge every one of you all that would, at least 100 people, at least 100 of you are watching tonight or watching a, a restream at another point. Some of you all catch it at a later point. I'm talking to you. Will you uh, consider uh, supporting us tonight in some kind of way? I've asked at least 100 people to give a $20 gift tonight. That would be really, really fantastic. I'd be thankful, thankful, thankful for each and every one of you. Uh, it has been uh, a great, he's, I, I asked him for an hour and a half, 7.30 to 9. I've got two, and, uh, two minutes and six seconds left. And I am grateful for the time that Dr. Hendricks has given unto us. Uh, the idea of individualism is antithetical to Christianity. These are takeaways that people have been getting uh, on tonight. Daniel Flores said, thank you both for a thoughtful and challenging conversation. Gracias por venir. Thank you for coming tonight. It was great having you on, hermano. Uh, I'm grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Raymond, thank you. Thank you for your kindness in coming on. I greatly appreciate you. I, I'm hoping uh, uh, that you and uh, uh, and uh, Robbie Waddell are able to connect in the future. Uh, Raymond Harrison's a, a, a filmmaker and and uh, in, out there in Vegas, and uh, I'm hoping that he and he and Robbie had some interesting exchange on on last week. Thank you, thank you, thank you, precious dears. We love you. We greatly appreciate you. We are eagerly awaiting the coming of our Lord, and we are occupying until he comes. We are doing the works of him that sent us while it is day. Dr. Hendricks has challenged us on tonight to remember those primary works, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, the intellectual love of God, and your strength. And then that horizontal plane, to love your neighbor mm -hmm. as you love yourself. I'm going to leave the final words to you. Uh, if you want to say something, bless the people, challenge us in any way, and then I'll, we'll be closed out after that. Okay, I, I do. Um, someone mentioned at the beginning, uh, Miguel de la Torre. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to lift that that brother's name up. Uh, he's at 
um, out at Eilif in Denver, Miguel okay. de la Torre. And uh, he's a bad brother, he's an ethicist, uh, Hispanic brother. But uh, as and we I know him. Well, you got, you, you got to know him, man. Like we used to say, he's terrible with a <laughs> he's a, He's a good brother. Well, um, good. And if, I'd you, like to, if you help me make the connect, I'll, I'll certainly do it. If you say no he's, he's I'll do it. I'll, I'll email you uh, immediately. Okay. I um, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and uh, and I'm so so very heartened by this podcast for a lot of reasons. But um, and, and I've mentioned it, you know, the but the, the level the level the level of of faith fueled intellectual engagement is so important. Um, and much too rare these days. Um, high quality. This is a, such a high quality piece of work, brother. And I like to say to the people um, who are listening, um, I hope everyone realized what a really dangerous time we are in. Wow. Um, it's almost like Trump was sent as a metaphysical force of evil to open a Pandora's box of hatred. Um, and it's getting worse, and we have to we have to stand against it everywhere we can. We have to stand on the truth of the gospel. We have to hold up. Um, we have to hold up the gospel as a as a a guide for attaining a just and loving and healthy world. And we have to stand against the forces of evil that would destroy our children if we are not, if we let them. So thank you all for listening. Um, I pleasure to continue this struggle. Um, I don't fight with my fists anymore. I used to, but I'm right fighting with the pen now. And uh, support me and I will support you. God bless everyone. Brother Alvarado, we got to stay in touch, man. You're the kind of brother I want as a dear friend and confidant. So God bless you I would all. Like Blessings to you. Thank you, friends, for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks, for My being pleasure. with us. Thank you all. Look up next week. We'll be back. The Lord willing and the creek don't rise. We'll be here <laughs> on Global Pentecostal Perspective. Right.